afternoon. Um, this is my first OpenStack Summit, and I'm presenting, so it's quite exciting moment for me. And um, uh, based on some of the sessions that I've seen so far on the networking uh, track, it seems like networking is still quite important for uh, many of the folks um, sitting here. So we do care about the network. It's just quite um, exciting time, actually, for the folks you know who are doing the networking because of the IoT. Internet of Technology or Internet of Things, um, and uh, especially the NFB use cases puts a lot of demand um, on the network. So my talk is going to be primarily focused on uh, how do we address the scale, how we are going to achieve the uh, sort of like the modularity with the right kind of performance and uh, right kind of security. Um, my name is Manuel Huda. I'm a lead architect, part of Cisco InterCloud Services Group. Um, so in this session, I'll be talking about how we're going to uh, achieve the scale of the network, both the overlay as well as underlay, and you know what I would like to call an integrated overlay. Integrated overlay is all about bringing the virtual world and the physical world together. At the end of the day, that's, that's, that's quite critical. And you know everything um, that we do from a networking standpoint has to be exposed uh, through OpenStack. right? That's our unified API. So uh, the, the, the focus of the talk is also going to be uh, making sure that everything and uh, anything and everything that we do to add to the scale of the network is exposed uh, through, uh, through the API of the OpenStack. So here is a quick agenda. Before I dive into the intercloud network architecture and scale, I would uh, like to give you a 30,000 feet overview of what the intercloud is all about. Uh, then I'll go over the tenant network connectivity model because uh, that's quite important for us to understand. We are not defining our use cases or our requirement, you know, sitting in some kind of lab, right? These are driven by our tenants, our customers. Those customers are internal uh, SaaS application provider. Also, we are talking to different allies partners who are also feeding us uh, those uh, those information. And then I'll talk about the network architecture. You know, once we understand the different connectivity model and the different requirements, then I'm going to, um, you know, discuss how we are addressing all of those requirements through underlay as well as overlay. At the end of the day, your underlay foundation has to be very strong. It underlay has to underlay network has to scale itself. It needs to be performant. It needs to give you the kind of flexibility that you are looking for. And at the end of the day, you need to be able to manage it uh, from a day to operational standpoint also. So I'll, I'll talk about all of that. Um, you know, scale without the right kind of performance optimization is not going to give you anything, right? You might be able to achieve a large number of scale, but at the end of the day, your system needs to be performant as well. So I'm going to talk about some of the performance optimization that we are doing um, in our, you know, for, uh, to, to meet our uh, tenant uh, connectivity requirements. Then I'll go into L4 Plus services as well and how we're going to uh, achieve the scale for L4 Plus services. And um, you know everything that we do, we have to be exposing uh, through the unified uh, OpenStack API. So I'll talk about the tenant consumption model as well. What are the different uh, approaches that we are taking there? And some of the future direction. And towards the end of the session, I'd like to you know, have some Q&A uh, from you and some feedback. So what is intercloud? Intercloud uh, model is really based on the cloud federation. At the end of the day, it's about interconnecting and integrating the clouds, primarily OpenStack-based clouds, right? operated by Cisco and our partners. We need to be able to deliver infrastructure as a service, or PaaS and SaaS, um, across all of these uh, cloud in a very um, um, in, 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 a, in a centralized manner. Any service operated by anyone, deployed anywhere, should be able to be consumed by anyone. So that's the, that's the sort of like the goal. So here is a quick example of um, how a tenant can go ahead and consume uh, the services. The tenant is sitting probably somewhere in Europe, should be able to consume the services you know, across the globe. Right? The idea here is to be able to interconnect all of those uh, um, um, uh, clouds and then be able to expose those services um, in a sort of like unipa unified manner so that the tenant can come in any geographic location, but they should be able to consume the services um, from, uh, from our cloud platform. 
to make this happen, there's a lot of network-related capabilities that we need to offer, right? As you can imagine here, there's a lot of um, uh, federation that needs to happen. We need to be able to offer consistent networking services on each of those cloud, so that will give us the ubiquity. Federation of the network services so that the users can view all this collection of intercloud services in a single resource, right? So that's quite critical for us. We need to be globally consistent, right? That's the key thing uh, that I would like to highlight here. At the end of the day, if you want to build such a massive cloud that needs to come together in a unified manner, you need to make sure that all those clouds that you're building are unified, right? I mean, it's, it's repeatable. You can build it at scale, right? So that's, uh, that's another thing that, uh, that's quite important. And then we need to be able to uh, be, uh, we need to be consistent on the identity front, on the security front, as well as the network addressing scheme, right? These are all important stuff for the Federation. So interconnecting, uh, all of these, you know, the virtual private networking is another key element for us, right? When you create this virtual private network, you've got to make sure that, that those networks can span across the different cloud as well, right? So that would require you uh, some, um, you know, um, some level of segmentation or, or isolation in between the, uh, between the tenants. So uh, how are we going to achieve all of this? At the end of the day, all those cloud providers need to come together and interconnect them through some kind of um, private or public uh, internet exchange points, right? So that's how they're going to be, uh, th that's how they're going to be interconnected to. Now, as I mentioned, you know, we are trying to create the reference architecture. At the end of the day, all the small boxes that you see there that say CIS, those are the individual fabric that we need to build. And that fabric needs to be uh, built in a very repeatable manner so that we can scale. Now, you know, uh, the way we are trying to come up with or uh, coming up with this architecture is based on uh, Cisco ACI fabric uh, network technology. Uh, using OpenStack. So let's quickly uh, zoom into what it means. But before I do that, I would like to quickly discuss the network, the tenant connectivity model. I think it's quite important, as I mentioned, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you need to be able to expose those networking capabilities to your tenant, right? And you know, different tenant has a different uh, level of uh, connectivity requirements. So I would like to quickly walk you through what are some of those connectivity requirements, right? Once we understand that, then we can define the requirements for both underlay as well as the overlay. At the end of the day, we are taking a very top-down centric approach. We are not really defining the use cases by ourselves. These are uh, getting, um, we are getting them from our tenants and from our customers. So we are taking this top-down approach, right? We are looking at what are the services that we're gonna be exposing, and then we are designing our underlay as well as the overlay network based on that. So um, in this, um, in this uh, picture on your right, um, this is one of the CIS, sort of like the fabric or the pod or the region, however way you want to call it. At the end of the day, you want to go ahead and you, know, you want to build that uh, fabric, right? Um, and um, as far as the different kind of connection goes, um, on, on to, to the IXPs, right? Some of the enterprise customers who has uh, a requirement for low, low latency application, right? They need to be able to connect to that pod through the IXP, through the internet exchange provider, right? So the idea here is to uh, extend the enterprise customer network, which is tenant A, that network needs to be extended all the way up to, up to this uh, CIS pod. So, that's what we call uh, private link direct, right? This is a direct connection. Now the second type of uh, tenant might be like the tenant B, right? These are our alliance partner um, customers. These are the customers that our uh, alliance partners already has, right? Telstra, for example, I mean, they have large number of MPLS L3 VPN customers, right? And if, you, if the Telstra wants to offer the cloud services, then how are you gonna, I, you know, bring your, the, the Telstra and PLS L3 VPN customers into our provider, in, in, into, into our cloud, right, in a fully isolated manner. 
So there is, the, there is a notion of this MPLS L3 VPN mapping uh, down, to, down to our cloud. And then you have the other type of customers, which might be uh, the MPLS L3 VPN customers that are offered by uh, some kind of SPs, right? And they have the internet exchange point, um, you know, uh, connectivity there. So uh, they can also extend their MPLS L3 VPN network connectivity uh, to our, 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 our cloud as well. And the fourth and, and the other type of connections are like, you know, the, uh, the overlay, VPN as a service, right? This is what typically uh, what, uh, you know, if you want to just use the internet, then VPN as a service is sort of like an overlay uh, VPN uh, services that, uh, that, that can be offered uh, uh, from the pod. So this generates a lot of demand on the network, as you can imagine, right? Both on the underlay side as well as on the overlay, right? So I'm going to quickly go through that, you know. Um, one other thing I would like to quickly talk about is the tenant profile, right? In, in, in CIS, every tenant gets their own dedicated sort of like network namespace, right? So what that means is that, you know, from a security standpoint, what those tenants can do is they can bring the, create their own private network, assign the IP address, bring their own IPs, they can go ahead and route those IPs into their private um, uh, private network, right? Um, they can um, use the floating IP to go out to the internet. So basically, essentially, what we are offering here is um, every tenant has, uh, you know, every tenant is fully isolated from each other. Now, uh, this puts a lot of pressure from a scalability standpoint on the network, both on the underlay as well as on the overlay. So um, at the end of the day, the tenant consumes the overlay network, right? The network that you expose to OpenStack, right? But your underlay foundation needs to be very, very strong, right? This is where we are leveraging the Cisco technology, Cisco um, application centric infrastructure uh, fabric to uh, you know, form or give that underlay uh, uh, foundation. So some of the key requirements for us for the underlay, um, you know, we all always talk about uh, the overlay scale, right? But at the end of the day, overlay scale wouldn't matter really much if your underlay doesn't scale also, right? So from a um, you know from a requirement standpoint, here are the list of things that I have highlighted here, automation is one of the key things for us, right? Um, automation because we started when we started our cloud journey, we started with you know, the standalone devices, right? With the standalone, it takes uh, literally days to really to bring up the fabric. But with, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to do much better than that, right? So we need a lot of automation really to bring up uh, those pods or the fabric. We need to be able to linearly scale or horizontally scale. The idea behind there is that, you know, in day one, we'll not be having like, two or uh, you know, uh, hundreds of racks deployed right, per, per fabric. What we would like to do is like, we would like to start small and then we would, would like to scale out down the road. right? And we need to have that kind of flexibility. It, the network needs to be very highly available. right? Availability needs to be there in, in, in every layer. right? At the, epic, at, at the controller layer, at the at the top of the X switch, at, 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 at the spine layer, at every layer, we need to make sure that we build a very highly available uh, network. It needs to be modular also. Modular because we want to use the same fabric, and we would like to use that fabric to bring the different kind of workloads. So that's the reason the modularity aspect is also quite important. Security compliance and uh, you know, ease of data operation is one of the critical uh, requirements for us. And, and application-centric uh, infrastructure meets all of this requirement, right? So let me quickly show you how we are building the, uh, this, this shared fabric, right? So um, here, as you can see, so I mentioned about um, the automation, right? Automation is one of the critical things uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that I mentioned. So those of you who build uh, the data center fabric, you know how many, uh, how, how many hours you have to spend just to stand up the fabric itself, right? With the ACI, what it does for us is as soon as you 
um, connect your leaf and spine switches, and as long as, uh, as uh, you know, as soon as you connect your controller, which is the EPIC controller, uh, the topology gets discovered automatically for you. Not only that, not only the topology gets discovered, it, it will also make sure that all the physical wearing and image and everything is in the right order, right? If it finds out that you know one of the top of the rack switch is not connected properly or appropriately, then it will it will tell you uh, uh, right then right there. So that's that's quite critical for us, right? So essentially, we can bring our sort of like fabric stand up time from days into 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 minutes, basically, into hours or into minutes, right? So. And, and from a, a scalability standpoint, the fabric doesn't have to be stand up with all of the racks uh, for, for, for the entire fabric, right? If you want to grow up to, let's say, 70 or 80 racks, you can start with, let's say, three to five racks, and then you can horizontally scale out. You can just keep adding uh, more and more racks into, into the fabric. The fabric should be able to accommodate that for you. If you want to uh, scale your spine switches, um, you know, or if you want to have more pore density, all you have to do, do is just add more line cuts into your spine switches, and then you should be able to scale that way. If you need more um, control plane scale, you, you can add more EPIC controllers. If you need more hypervisors, you should be able to just add that into the fabric. One other key benefit that I would like to highlight with the fabric is that, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's highly modular. So if you want to bring different kind of workload, that, let's say in this picture I've shown uh, three different boxes in the control plane side, right? So, you know, uh, if you want to bring, let's say, ML2 plugin in one of one of the, you know, one of the one of the domain, and if you want to bring the GBP group-based policy plugin, or if you want to bring, let's say, Kubernetes, right? And if you want to offer, let's say, Hadoop as a service, you should be able to slice that fabric into multiple segments or multiple uh, domains, and then as soon as you add the different hypervisors into the fabric the fabric should be able to automatically uh, place those hypervisors into the appropriate uh, domain. So it's very powerful from an automation standpoint. You don't have to manually do a lot of, lot of uh, those configurations, which is typically error prone, right? So it brings, gives you a lot of automation. As far as the HA goes, as I mentioned, the HA is built into the entire fabric, right? If you look at it on the spine, even if you lose one of the spine switches there, right, you still have uh, 70 to 75 percent capacity there. You can lose like two of the spine, no issues there. You can upgrade your spine without any problem as well. We have the redundancy built into the tor, right, into the leaf switches, right? So two of the leaf switches are function as a BPC pair. So from each and every UCS servers that we are connecting into those tors, uh, you know, one, if one of the tor dies, no issues. You know, you still have uh, connectivity. And then from the leaf to the spine, we have like four links that is connected from the tor to the spines, basically, or the leaf to the spines. So if you lose one of the, one of the link there, there are like four links. If you lose one of the link, then reconvergence time is like uh, uh, around like 100, 100 microseconds. It's not even 100 milliseconds, it's 100 microseconds. So redundancy is built into each and every layer of this fabric. So uh, you know, once you have this uh, very strong foundation, then what you can do is this is just a simple, very simple example, right? You can have, you can install. So you know, um, there is a lot of concerns in terms of how you're going to scale the neutron, right? So if the if your fabric can scale up to, let's say, you know, thousands of tenants or tens of thousands of tenant network, then what essentially you can do is like you can slice your fabric and you can allocate the resources for each and every uh, controller instance. Let's say in this example, we have three OpenStack controller sharing the same fabric. And then you know, any hypervisor that you associate with, with this controller, you should be able to create this logical sort of like uh, data center, if you, if you will. Right? So within the ACI fabric, we call that VMM domain. So using the construct called like VMM domain, you can automatically, I mean, the fabric automatically figure out, you know, which hypervisor goes to which, uh, which controller. And this is how you can achieve the scale of your neutron as well. And that's exactly what we're uh, planning to do. 
So now that I talked about the underlay, right? I mean, underlay scale from an operational standpoint also, ACA fabric gives you, um, you know, quite a lot of simplicity and ease of use, and it brings a lot of automation. But, you know, at the end of the day, overlay is what the tenant really consumes, right? It is this neutron router or the segment or ports, you know, on the OpenStack side is what the tenant typically consumes, right? So overlay, you know, to pro provide the right kind of isolation is one of the uh, critical aspect for any cloud. And uh, some people take pure overlay approach. Some people think that, you know, the problem can be solved with the underlay network. What we are saying is that why not integrate overlay, right? Take the best um, of both worlds, basically, right? Underlay gives you a certain scale, performance capability, and you know, with the overlay technology also, if you can merge both of them together, you can get a very sort of like robust and performance system that will eventually serve your, uh, serve your tenants. So what is that integrated overlay? Before I talk about that integrated overlay, here are the list of things that needs to be offered by uh, the overlay network. And for us, as I mentioned, for each and every tenant, we have a, a separate uh, namespace, right? For the security reason, as well as to offer the premium services and the flexibility. All of these features that I have listed there needs to be offered at scale with the right kind of performance, right? And then you also need to uh, make sure that your data operation is very simple, right? because you can build a massive scale cloud, but at the end of the day, if you cannot operate it very efficiently, then you know, it's not gonna cut it for you. So what is that integrated overlay? Let's quickly go through this. So here, as you can see, um, we are, first of all, we are moving away from the VLAN-based network into VXLAN-based network, right? It's a two separate domain here, right? So our fabric, the ACA fabric, is based on VXLAN. So the, you know, the so it's a, it's a two different domain that we are talking about. And then, in between your top of the X switch into the hypervisor, is also we are extending the VXLAN. Right. So this is how we are um, achieving the scale of the network or the network segment. Now we are also um, going to be using Oplex proxy and the agent. So the idea there is the Oplex proxy and agent, what it does for you is it gives you the scale from a configuration standpoint. No longer you have to maintain all the device-specific configuration details on the neutron side or on the APIC control or on your network controller side, right? What essentially happens is, you know, you define your intent, let's say on, the, on, on your OpenStack side, and then that intent gets passed down into the APIC controller. And then Epic Controller tells the intent to the top of the X switch, and the top of the X switch instruct the agent that is sitting on the hypervisor to do the actual configuration. So by doing that, you are delegating your configuration responsibility, um, just like the way we are doing that on the data plane networking, right? We are distributing our functions into different devices. We are also distributing this configuration function into different devices. So this would be the reason why we can scale up to such a large number of, of the tenant. Because if you don't do that, all of those configuration details needs to be there either in the neutron or it needs to be there on the network controller, right? And we are trying to, um, uh, we are not gonna, do, we, we, we are taking this uh, distributed kind of approach here. So, um, this, this gives you a lot of benefits. Let me just quickly um, walk you through to some of them. So here's a quick snapshot. So one other benefit that um, I didn't mention in the previous slide. So think of it, right? I mean, if, if one of your attendant is complaining that, you know, my application is not performing very well, right? Or one of the VM is down, right? Where to start? Is it an underlay problem? Is it an overlay problem? You wanna go to OpenStack first? You wanna go to your, um, a network site first, where exactly do you start, right? Wouldn't it be nice to bring all of this information together? This is exactly what the Oplex does for you. It brings the virtual and the physical networking stats under the same uh, pane of glass 
so that you know, at any given time you would know what is the status of my VNIC, what is the status of my uh, actual physical uh, network interface. So as I mentioned, I mean, you know, you can achieve the all the scale and everything, but at the end of the day, because of all the NFB use, uh, use cases or, you know, uh, that requires a lot of sort of like network uh, performance or the optimization, you know, you, we, we need to make sure that our network is performing uh, very, very well. So there are four different areas where we are, um, we are looking at to optimize. The, the performance. One is, of course, the L2, L3 um, packet forwarding behavior. We want to make sure that we have the optimal behavior of um, L2, L3. ARP separation is another one. Um, ARP is, is a good thing for, uh, for, um, for the networking stuff, right? There is a good re uh, reason why ARP exists. But at the same time, all the L2 uh, related security vulnerabilities that um, we face today is due to ARP as well, right? So we want to make sure that we suppress those ARP at the right place. And then we are also looking at the VXLAN offload to be done on the NIC and, and, and the smart scheduler. Those are four different areas where um, we are uh, looking to uh, optimize. So um, as I mentioned, you know, we, are, um, we want to leverage both the hardware as well as the software, right? Um, to make sure that we have the optimal packet forwarding behavior. So here is an example of what we're doing here. We are bringing the full switching support all the way down to the OVS. So if the packet needs to be um, handled you know, within the same host, if you have two different VMs sitting on the same host, there is no reason why the packet needs to go to the top of the X switch. Right? If the VM is sitting on a different host, then it makes sense to punt the packet to the TOR. Right? So this is one of the things that we are doing. We are also. Um, this would be the behavior if you don't suppress your ARP. If the ARP is spread across um, you know, um, all the TOR, then this is going to be the behavior. We want to go ahead and suppress the ARP right over here on the OVS. So the ARP doesn't really spread across, across the entire, entire fabric. We are also, um, you know, for our L3 forwarding also, right? If you have two different v, um, VM, sitting on two different, let's say, uh, VXLAN ID or, or, or VLAN segment, but those VMs are sitting on the same host, right? You don't have to necessarily punt the packet into some kind of gateway. We'd like to make sure that we handle it locally. So both L2 as well as the L3 forwarding happens locally on, 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 on the host if the VM is sitting on the same host, right? If the VM is, let's say, going into different hosts, then of course you need to forward the packet uh, to the top of the X switch or some, you know, uh, top of the X switch. So by doing that, we are essentially, um, you know, uh, delegating the responsibility where it makes more sense, right? For the locally switched or routed packet, it's handled on the OVS. Uh, for the packet that needs to go outside, you know, the packet goes to the top of the X switch. We are also evaluating a you know, couple of NIC cards. We, since we moved from VLAN to uh, VXLAN, we want to make, you know, make sure the list of features that I have listed there, these are the features that we are looking to support using um, a couple of NIC cards that I have listed there. This is going through an, uh, uh, engineering analysis as we speak. So hopefully in the next summit, we should be able to share some numbers, you know, some of the performance numbers on this. One other performance optimization that we are doing is um, around um, uh, the scheduler, because right now, if you look at the Nova scheduler, um, you know it doesn't take any network constraint into consideration. So we want to make sure that you know the network constraints, such as your bandwidth, your latency, your you know if if you if one of your service VM is is pretty busy, we want to make sure that you know all those things are taken into consideration before. Uh, the Nova plays the different uh, different VMs into into the into the network. So here is the solver scheduler. This is again something that Cisco is uh, leading and driving. And um, you know, um, you, 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 all of you can use this uh, to to more intelligently place the workload. So I've talked about the performance optimization. Now let's quickly go through the scale. There are a number of um, scaling parameters that we are looking at. I didn't put any concrete number here simply because 
you know, this is going through some validation or the engineering analysis right now. Uh, hopefully, in the next summit, I should be able to share some um, uh, concrete numbers. But from a scale standpoint, we're looking for thousands of uh, tenancy scale. We're looking for tens of thousands of tenant network scale, right? So these are the kind of scale that we are looking for. And then tens of thousands of VM scale. And we need to be able to scale. So when I'm saying, you know, scaling those numbers, the list of um, components that we have to scale also, right? It's not just, um, you know, um, you, you have to scale each and every of those components um, to, to achieve, the, achieve the kind of scale, you know, that we, that, that, that we are looking, uh, looking for here. So NetPad scale is one of the key elements for us. So in order to scale the NetPad, we are distributing the NetPad into individual host. So uh, it's no longer sort of like centralized. So this is how, even for the PAT and the NAT, NAT is for your floating IPs. So uh, since we are distributing that into individual hosts, um, you know, we, we, can, we can achieve uh, millions of PAT sessions and thousands of NAT sessions um, you know, by, um, uh, by taking this approach. So those of you who are familiar with the DBR, DBR is taking the very similar kind of approach. Even though you know, for the PAT, PAT is centralized in the network node, but you know, the NAT is fully distributed into individual host. So, um, um, you know, once we scale our L2, L3, and once we scale our NAT pad, we also need to make sure that we scale our uh, DHCP and DNS as well, right? So this is where we are introducing the PNR, right? We, we uh, deployed DNS mask, right, uh, based approach, but that didn't really scale for us. Right? Neither did it um, provide us the kind of stability that we were looking for. So, you know, PNR is, is, is a Cisco product that can scale up to tens of thousands of um, uh, network uh, or the segments. Right? So we are introducing the PNR and uh, with, the, with the relay agent that will help us to achieve the kind of tens of thousands of tenant network scale that we are looking for. So this is, this is how it, it will be done. Basically, so as far as as far as the you know from a scaling standpoint, every DHCP relay will be uh, mapped to a PNR server that will give us the HA as well as uh, it will give us the scale. Let's quickly talk about L4 plus services. So I talked about scaling the L L2 segment, scaling the um, you know L3, scaling uh, DHCP and DNS. So now we also need to make sure that we can offer L4 plus services as well, right? This is where we deployed the HA proxy. HA proxy didn't really, um, was not stable enough and it didn't really uh, scale very well for us. So what we're doing is we're working with our partners because Cisco doesn't have any um, load balancer, right? So we're working with our partners to, um, um, you know, working with our partners to provide us uh, the Albus uh, Albus uh, solution, but at the end of the day, the plugin uh, piece is going to be a standard plugin, right? There are few things that we are looking for from a scaling standpoint. Uh, we are looking for um, the auto scale functionality based on the service VM, and um, the idea there would be like you you will have a Neutron sort of like Albus service plugin that will talk to uh, some kind of um, controller, and the controller is going to manage the different kind of service VM. Uh, so that's how uh, we, are, uh, we are looking to achieve the scale. From a high availability standpoint, we are looking for active, active kind of uh, high availability. And then we are also uh, going to be offering the SSL offload. For the VPN as a service, it's going to be a warm arm mode kind of deployment. So if you look at the OpenSwan, you know that your uh, VPN as a service um, implementation is the reference implementation uh, does it based on your L3, so your Neutron router and the VPN service are tied together. So that brings a lot, you know, some challenges for us from a performance as well as the scale standpoint. So what we are trying to do here is really decouple the L3 um, gateway function from the VPN as a service function. So we are instantiating the CSR 1000V router just to offer the VPN as a service function. Uh, and L3 forwarding is going to be done uh, through top of the rack switch or the uh, open virtual switch. So this is how we are getting the optimal behavior for the L3 forwarding, but for the VPN as a service, 
we will have dedicated appliances uh, for that. There is a dependency on NCS plus ESC controller, so there will be plugin um, that uh, that that will be uh, upstream uh, on that as well. So let me quickly um, touch upon on the tenant consumption. So from a scale performance standpoint, um, you know I've gone through uh, some of those approaches that we are taking. But let's quickly talk about the tenant consumption at the end of the day, that, that really matters. That, that is the most critical thing. In calendar year 15, we are gonna be going with um, the Neutron ML2 based route. What that means is that we're gonna be scaling the Neutron router, we'll be scaling the traditional sort of like L2 network, the ports, DHCP, DNS, everything, all the cool stuff that I talked about. But in calendar year 16, we are exploring the group-based policy plugin. Our plan is to move into the group-based policy plugin um, in, in, in calendar year 16. The idea there is really to offer a very simplified service. It should, it's based on intern driven, so you can express you know, your LBS offering in a much more granular format. You can, you know, it will help you uh, to consume the services in a much more simpler way. So, you know, let me let me quickly introduce you the the, the group based policy. What it uh, what does it look like? So if you look at this one, you see that if you if you want to go ahead and bring your um, you know the web tier or your DB tier application, right? And if you want to apply some kind of um, load balancer or the firewall, it's gonna it's gonna be very very easy for you as an application architect to express that, and then all the details or the implementation details are gonna be uh, hidden from you. So um, there's a you know, bunch of other companies um, are contributing to the group-based policy plugin, but where the differentiation comes in is when you uh, use the group-based policy plugin with the ACI. Because the ACI gives you the sort of like the integrated kind of policy model. So think of ACI as a policy-driven sort of like network fabric, and the group-based policy plugin is its API layer, right? So all the cool stuff that the ACI has to offer can be expressed in the group-based policy plugin. So um, here are the list of things, list of differentiation, list of capabilities that the group-based policy plugin can offer in above and we wind off whatever the ML2 can offer today. Um, Intent-driven consumption model, private link orchestration is another one. Some people call it like WinVPN. Right, we can, uh, we can do that with the group-based policy plugin. We can offer the service chaining. These are quite critical for the NFB use cases where you want to su uh, subject uh, the, the tenant traffic to go through, let's say, load balancer, firewall, and things like that. So if you want to offer that service chaining or service teaching, you should be able to do that with the group-based policy plugin. It will allow you to offer the flexible QoS um, implementation. This is quite important for the noise, noisy neighbor problem. If you want to rate limit your uh, traffic from one VM to another VM or from one tenant to another tenant, you, you know, this, uh, the group-based policy plugin should be able to help you in that. The critical and the most important thing is the fault and the performance management aspect of it, right? At the end of the day, as I mentioned, once you bring the underlay and overlay together with the ACI fabric and the group-based uh, policy plugin, then you can have a lot more visibility into why an application is not performing very well, or if there is something wrong with one of the, one of the um, connection, you should be able to just go to a single um, you know, pane of glass to narrow down why, why, uh, why you have a problem. So what, what are some of the future direction? Um, you know, all of these things that I've talked to you about, um, are something that we are doing today, but you know we are looking to you know the, as I mentioned the group-based policy plugin is something that we are looking to do in calendar year 16. The reason we are delaying this a little bit is because we want to make sure ML2 plugin and the group-based policy plugin can be offered uh, from the same OpenStack instance, right? We also want to make sure that you know we offer the NFP services at scale, right, with the group-based policy plugin. And as far as the IPv6 goes, we are starting uh, to deploy IPv6 this year, but next year we're gonna be looking at larger scale, and we'll be also offering the SLB66 uh, uh, services. So in summary, 
ACI with the group-based policy plugin and ML2 plugin uh, will uh, you know, simplify our tenant consumption model quite a bit. Uh, we want to build a very highly performance system that, that scales. We also want to make sure that our data operation is very seamless. So with that, I'm open for Q&A. Thank you.